Okay, so far in Rutherford model, we have discovered that Rutherford, during the course of his experiment, discovered discrepancy between J.D. Thomson model and the practical experimental observation. So with further experiments, he came up with his own model. And his model is like this. The first stark difference between J.D. Thomson model and Rutherford model is Rutherford model has disjoint positive and negative charge unlike J.J. Thompson model in which they were embedded into each other and the model is pretty simple the positive charge and most of the mass of an atom is concentrated in an extremely small volume and Rutherford called that as nucleus and the electrons revolve around the nucleus in circular orbits due to electrostatic force of attraction and we have seen that this electrostatic force of attraction actually provides the centripetal force to the electron to actually be able to revolve around the nucleus. So pretty simple straightforward model and it explains some of the discrepancy that he found in Jerry Thompson model. Now if you remember we had two strong observation which indicated that JJ Thompson model may not be true. One of the observation was the team of Rutherford was ex performing experiment in a glass chamber like this and they were bombarding air molecules by helium nuclei and they were observing the result of the current that is flowing in the circuit and I gave you an idea that they were expecting a graph of current uniform like this but what they got was irregular result and from here the whole story started that J.J. Thompson model may not be true. Now Rutherford will have to be able to explain this result through his model. Now another thing that Rutherford model should be able to explain is the last deviation by alpha particle. The beam of alpha particle undergoes large deviation when it is made to pass through gas molecules. If these two observations are explained by Rutherford model, then only the model will be accepted. Now let's quickly see how these two observations will be explained by Rutherford model. The first is deviation. Let's see. Deviation as we talked about could not be explained by J.J. Thomson model because if an alpha particle comes with very high energy, it will penetrate through and through the atom. There is no chance of the alpha particle getting stopped by this J.J. Thomson model. Now in this case, alpha particle can be stopped because of high positive charge density at the center. Now the deviation. The deviation cannot occur in this case because no matter from where the alpha particle is colliding, it will penetrate through and through the, the entire atom. But here the deviation can be explained because you would study in the collision theory when two spheres collide center to center then there is no deviation. Either the sphere will move forward or it will come back. But if there is a deviation in the center of two spheres and they are colliding, suppose there is a distance A between the center of these two spheres and they are colliding like this. If this was the direction in which this sphere was moving, then after collision, there will be change in the direction of the sphere. This is intuitive to understand and you study this in great length when you study collision theory. Now, since the set mass is at the center and the position of the alpha particle, if it is coming head on where the center of the nucleus and the center of the alpha particle is matching, then there, the alpha particle will rebound back. And the change in the path would be by 180 degree. But if the alpha particle is not colliding head to head, there is a deviation between the center of the nucleus and the center of the alpha particle. Then the alpha particle won't go back or won't penetrate through or won't pass through. There will be change in the path of the alpha particle by certain angle. And mathematically it is possible if we assume these two as a sphere, perfect sphere, and we know the radius of these two, the radius of the nucleus and the radius of the alpha particle, then it is easy to calculate what will be the deviation in the path of the alpha particle. That's easy, that, that you learn when you learn collision theory. So that explains 
why there is a deviation in the path of alpha particle now if alpha particle just grazes through the nucleus and touches it just touches it it will almost pass through so the deviation will be zero degree and when the center of the nucleus and the center of the alpha particle comes head to head then the deviation will be of 180 degree the alpha particle will rebound back so the deviation is from zero degree to 180 degree in these two special cases whenever there will be certain shift of alpha particle from the center of the nucleus then the deviation could be anything between zero degree to 180 degree this model is able to explain the deviation in the alpha particle that was observed in the experiment before now let's come to this graph now rutherford as per the jerry thompson model was expecting the current graph this to be uniform but the current graph is not uniform it is rather sporadic now the reason is the reason is if you think from the jerry thompson model point of view then there is a collision and there will be certainly emission of electron because the force with which this alpha particle will collide will be very huge and every collision will definitely result some number of electrons out of the atom so it is expected that more or less the graph should be uniform but here in this case the alpha particle can actually can collide at any degree with the nucleus it could be at zero degree it could be at 180 degree it could be at any degree between them so the impact of the collision will be different for each atom it won't be the same because it's not going to pass through in, in any case because it's it's it, it may actually pass through the space between the nucleus empty space in the atom it can actually collide with the nucleus and when it collides with the nucleus the impact could be anything between zero degree to 180 degree so the variation is huge so that's why it will be very difficult to predict what will happen actually with the alpha particle with what impact it will collide with the atom so it's very difficult to predict and it could be anything the graph can come out to be anything if the alpha particle will have a very good collision then electron knockout will be high if the alpha particle is just rebounding back from the atom then the electron knockout will be less so that also explains the sporadic nature of the graph which rutherford observed and from where he thought that jerry thompson model may not be true so now when he has given this model now these two observations are well explained from this model so quite a good development from the previous model and the world has something new in hand for two more years this model was given in 1911 but this model was good enough only to survive for two more years until 1913 when Niel Bohr and many many more will work to give a new model that will be studied as Bohr model now before closing this up we'll have to look what was the problem with this model now Maxwell at that time was working in classical physics and Maxwell was a great thinker of his time now he gave a theory now according to his theory any charge which is accelerating should emit energy now I'll come to the explanation of this a little later but for now you should take it on the face of it any charge which is accelerating will radiate energy now any charge which is accelerating not moving any charge which is moving may not radiate energy if a charged particle if a charge is moving with uniform velocity then it will not radiate energy any charge which is accelerating that means it has some acceleration then that charge will emit energy now this was the theory given by Maxwell now, it was well accepted and experiments has verified this theory to be true so it was almost a fact of that time so any model will be tested with this touchstone of the fact that was given by Maxwell so this model will, was also tested with the Maxwell theory that any charge which is accelerating should emit energy now the electron as we talked before is moving in a circular motion and in a circle whenever a particle is moving in a curved path the direction of the velocity the direction of this velocity changes so even if the speed remains constant the velocity changes so when there is a change in velocity of course there's acceleration so particle moving in circular path electron in this case moving in a circular path is having acceleration so to say in the terminology of maxwell these electrons are accelerated 
Now these electrons are accelerated so they must emit energy. They cannot violate this Maxwell's rule. So if they emit energy what would happen here is these electrons orbit will start shrinking and ultimately these electrons will have to move into the nucleus. Now the question is how come the electron is stable if Maxwell's theory is true and Maxwell's theory was true. So according to Maxwell's theory this model won't be correct model. Now just to have a little bit of discussion as to why the electron's orbit should shrink let me give you a little bit of feel. See the force of electrostatic force of attraction this electrostatic force is giving centripetal acceleration. Now centripetal acceleration if you know is mv squared by r. Now if you don't know then it's okay you learn gradually but if you know centripetal acceleration at this point of time it's mv squared upon r. Now just suppose the electron is revolving it is accelerated right so it will radiate some energy when it radiates certain energy the volume will decrease because the energy will the radiated energy will be at the cost of kinetic energy of the electron so when energy is radiated kinetic energy will decrease and hence the velocity now the velocity has decreased now when the velocity decreases suppose it is v1 and it moves to v2 now since the velocity has decreased the required centripetal force will be less now the force of attraction is same. The force of attraction doesn't depend upon the velocity. It depends on the charge. The charge is remaining the same. So the force of attraction is the same. So the force which was previously towards the center is the same. But the centripetal force which is required now is lesser. So effectively what will happen, the total amount of force, a part of it will be used as centripetal force. The total electrostatic force of attraction, a part of it will be required as centripetal force and the part will still a part of it will remain left out that will not be required as centripetal force suppose the force was 10 newton the centripetal force previously was 10 newton so it was balanced now because of decreased velocity the required centripetal force is just 8 newton but the force provided due to electrostatic force is still 10 newton so there's a left out 2 newton of force now that 2 newton of force will pull the electron towards the center and that's why the radius of the orbit will shrink okay so, and that will keep happening and shrinking 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 will lead it to go inside the nucleus and the electron the atom the system cannot remain stable like this so that was the problem secondly Rutherford also did not explain how will be the arrangement of the electron around the nucleus will it be in one circle or two circle or three circle how many electrons in which circle that part was not explained by Rutherford and if that was, was not explained you would understand that atomic spectra will also be not explained by Rutherford atomic spectra we talked a little when we studied JJ Thomson model and we'll talk a lot more when we study Neil Bohr model so if you don't get this term don't worry it's just coming in the next model so due to this major discrepancy major drawback of Rutherford model was it could not stand up to the expectation of Maxwell's theory so it was to be rejected and it was done two years later when Bohr gave his model which we are going to study next